worker of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. This is God's word. Father, we ask that as you gather us today, that you would once again fill us to overflowing with the presence of your spirit, that you might then work through us in your world to serve our neighbors, to be beacons of love and hope. May you speak to us this morning as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillside. Please sing with us. When peace like a Our scripture reading comes from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. It says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, 
that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations. This is God's word. Well, again, good morning to you. Uh, So by way of introduction, just as a brief reminder, if you've joined us the last uh, few weeks, you know that we have been in Matthew 13 primarily, and we've been looking at some of what have been called the kingdom parables of Jesus. Uh, Bruce uh, preached and taught about the parable of the sower uh, and then uh, the parable of the weeds, And today, we're going to be looking at actually two parables, but really, they're teaching the exact same thing. And they're very short parables. They're only a few verses, but as I think you'll see, they are packed with great meaning for us. 
They're found in Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. And the passage reads like this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had and bought it. End of reading. Father, I pray now that you would speak through my very perf- imperfect and feeble lips to the people that you've gathered here this morning. May you proclaim your word and your truth clearly. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before I start preaching at you about the meaning of what we just read, I want to begin with a question for you to ponder. And the question is this. What do you treasure the most in your life? What do you treasure the most? For some of you, it may be something fairly simple. One time in an interview, Johnny Cash, sitting next to his wife, was asked... Uh, by an interviewer, what his definition of paradise was. And without skipping a beat, Johnny Cash looked over at his wife and said, paradise is this morning with her having coffee. Pretty smooth. In the year and a half before starting the church I planted in New York City, I would go up to strangers and, and oftentimes I would ask this question to them after initial kind of introductory conversation, I asked them to narrow down for me where they find hope. Where do you find hope? And the reason I asked that question is because it was sort of a wraparound way of hearing what people treasured most in their life, what they value. And I heard many answers. Family gives me hope. My career gives me hope. Money gives me hope. I remember some dude, I remember one dude said, I give me hope. Like, all right, well, we'll see how you're doing in 10 years, but, uh, you know, way to be confident. In uh, In our text today, Jesus says that ultimately the greatest possession is, of course, his kingdom. That that is what ought to be treasured the most. And to illustrate this, he uses the picture of hidden treasure and a pearl, both extraordinarily valuable items. How valuable? Well, let's talk about that. What is his kingdom worth? Well, first of all, it is so valuable that that one seeks and strives and works to get it. Indeed, the picture given in the parables is of a man searching and striving to find something. In the first parable, you have the treasure hunter, and the next, you have the merchant. A a, a little while back, one of my uh, weirder Facebook friends decided to put on his Facebook page the birth of, or a horse giving birth. Now, being that I have never witnessed a horse giving birth, I decided to watch it. Guys, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. It's also incredibly gross, but yes, pretty amazing. As I watched the horse pushing out this huge pony about halfway through, you could just sense how insanely difficult and painful the process was for this mama horse. She was squirming and turning and doing everything she could to get this baby out, but no matter what she did, that little pony just wasn't having it. He was plenty content staying in his home, thank you very much. So she's pushing and pushing and striving and striving, working, seeking with all of her might. And eventually, after agony upon agony, the pony, the treasure, is born. Perhaps when I asked you what your treasure was, nothing immediately came to mind. 
Well, one way to find out what your treasure is or what you actually treasure the most in life is, is to ask yourself, what do you strive after the most? What will you give your time and your talents and treasures, your own treasures to the most? What are you willing to work extra hard for? What are the things in your life that you think about when you don't have to think about anything at all? What really drives you? Answer those questions and you'll be able to identify what you treasure. That sort of striving and working is what Jesus says his kingdom is worth. Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus says in Luke 13, to strive after the narrow door of the kingdom. And Jeremiah 29.13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Indeed, the kingdom is so valuable that it even demands 100% obedience to obtain it. As a matter of fact, it even goes beyond that. In order to obtain the kingdom, it demands sacrifice of everything. Both men in the parables, upon finding the great treasures, immediately enjoy, sell all that they have to get it. They just they liquidate everything so that they can just have this treasure. Indeed, in in that day, that would have been like them giving up their lives to have the treasure of God's kingdom. Oftentimes, in the scriptures, one's property and one's possessions are closely interconnected with one's body, with one's very life. This is the picture given to us. Upon coming upon the treasure, they sacrifice everything. And indeed, that fits with the rest of what Jesus says about his kingdom in the Gospels. Remember, it is him that says one must pick up their cross daily if they are part of his kingdom, and one must die to themselves even joyfully because they see the kingdom of such incredible worth and value that it's not even a question for them. There's a man in Australia named Carl uh, Rabbiter who was willing to give up everything for his treasure. Quite literally, he sold away everything he owned and gave away all of his $3 million fortune to charity. Why did he do it? Well, he said, in his words, it was too heavy and he just wanted to be free. Having all that money was too heavy and he just wanted to be free. Now, I know some of you hear that and you're like, I'm willing to take over some of that load, brother. Go ahead, pile it on. But you understand what he's saying. For him, that freedom was what he treasured most. Again, to answer the question, what you really treasure, ask yourself, what would I be willing to suffer? What would I be willing to to bleed and die for in life? That's the treasure. And that's what Jesus says the kingdom is worth. It's worth everything. Well, okay, fair enough, right? That's uh, that's pretty clear. I suppose we could just leave it there, have a short little devotion. I could wrap it up. We could say a prayer. Maybe, you know, if you were in person with me, I could invite you down to the front to repent. And maybe I could just leave you with a challenge. Are you really valuing the kingdom of God the way Jesus says we ought to? But there's still a few issues we have to deal with here. And that is, I I really have not discussed yet the most important parts of this parable. What I mean is we haven't yet determined two very important things. Number one, the identity of the treasure hunter slash merchant in these parables. And number two, what the kingdom actually represents in the stories. So who is the man and what is the treasure in our parable? Well, first of all, let's go for the, let's figure out who the treasure hunter merchant is. Many, many scholars and theologians have said that these figures are meant to represent human beings, you and I. If this is so, then the meaning of the parable is simply that Jesus calls people to value his kingdom so much that they gladly give up everything to have it, which is basically what I've just preached to you. This interpretation is not without warrant. It isn't. It does make sense out of the biblical data in some parts as I shared with you. 
Jesus does indeed call his disciples to give up everything for the sake of the kingdom. But there's a problem with that interpretation on, I think, multiple levels. Number one, if I'm honest, I don't know a single human being that's actually pulled this off. Oh, I know many, like myself, uh, would say that our deepest treasure in life is God's kingdom. But when I look at the record of my life, I'm pretty convinced it doesn't reflect that all the time. I mean, the call of God is to love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself in thought, word, and deed at all times. And if I truly, really valued the kingdom of God above all things, then I would instinctively do those things. And yet I don't. And you don't either. Well, if that's the case, then the outcome of this parable is that nobody is the merchant and nobody is the treasure hunter. Well, that can't work. That won't make sense of what Jesus has said. I mean, he's told the parable for a reason. There is another way of interpreting these parables. And that is, of course, that the merchant slash treasure hunter actually is Jesus. Now, at first glance, depending on where you're coming from and your background, this might seem a strange interpretation, but stick with me here. First of all, in the previous parables of the kingdom found in Matthew 13, Jesus is clearly shown to be represented by the person doing the work in the parables. Secondly, when we look at what the merchant and treasure hunter actually does in the parables to obtain the treasure, this certainly fits the description of what Jesus alone actually did. In order to obtain, to buy his treasure, Jesus always strives fulfilling his father's perfect will. In order to get his pearl, Jesus sacrifices everything joyfully. Indeed, Hebrews 12 says, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If this is the case, if Jesus can be seen as the merchant in this parable, then the only question we have remaining to interpret is what is the treasure? What is the pearl? My guess is you probably already have a sense. The treasure is you. You are the treasure. Like the merchant, Jesus had to find you when you were lost and hidden in your sins. Like the merchant, Jesus had to seek after you. Indeed, that's what he says his mission was. He came to seek and save lost things, specifically lost people. In order to possess you, Jesus Christ joyfully gives up his everything on the cross, declaring, paid in full. It is finished. And here's one more piece of good news for all who hear this message. The treasure hunter is so excited that he not only pays enough for the treasure, he pays enough for the entire field. Now, why is that significant? Well, in the context of this parable, the field is said to represent the world, the whole world. And you know what that means? That means that through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus hasn't just paid for you, he's paid for them, for them, and for everyone. 
Jesus has become the satisfaction for the sins of all humanity. Your unsaved neighbor? Yes, that guy. Bought and paid for. Your unbelieving spouse? Yes, that person. Also bought and paid for. The drug addict? The murderer? The thief? The adulterer? And on and on it goes. Bought and paid for. There is no part of this field that Jesus has not atoned for. At the cross, Jesus takes upon himself the world's sin and imputes all who believe with his righteousness, thereby declaring all who believe treasures and pearls of great price in his sight. This is the great exchange. We're not worthy in and of ourselves to be considered treasure, but because he purchases us, because he exchanges with us our sin for his righteousness, we are made into treasures. You know, I've exchanged junk for treasure in my life before, When I was in seventh grade, maybe I had this come home to me in the most profound way, and I've thought about it often. I went over to my buddy Micah's house one time, and both of us were basketball card and baseball card collectors. He was definitely not as into it as I was. I mean, I had price guides so that I knew how much every card was worth. I mean, I had a lot of of cards. And so I brought over a stack of cards to his house, They were not much. I mean, there wasn't very impressive players in there. They were known as common cards back then, worth five cents a piece. And when I arrived at my friend Micah's house, to my great shock and awe, he had amazing cards. And they weren't taken care of at all. They were just kind of spread on his bedroom floor. He had, but but he had like early cards of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and Charles Barkley. And, And I'm not kidding, like three or four Michael Jordan rookie cards. Now, I don't expect that all of you are huge basketball fans, but I think even those of you who aren't know that Michael Jordan rookie cards might be quite valuable. Of course, back then, they weren't nearly as valuable as they are now, but I knew that they were going to be worth something. And so just sort of lobbing something out to my friend Micah, I said, hey, you know, would, what would you think about trading one of these cards for one of your Michael Jordans? I expected him to laugh me out of the room. I really did. I didn't think he was going to take it seriously at all. And to my great surprise, instead he said, yeah, that's fine, man. I'll take that uh, Dan Quisenberry card. I know, very obscure reference. You don't have to know who he is. I'll take that Dan Quisenberry card, and you can take the Michael Jordan. And I'm like, dude, are you serious? Are you serious? No, I was, you know, you don't want it to do this. No, no, I got three or four others, Eric. It's fine. Like, no, 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 I mean, I knew I was ripping him off. I mean, I knew that this was not a fair deal at all. I mean, I'm literally offering junk, and he's offering me the equivalent of gold. And yet he insisted. And so I took it. Still have it today, actually. Christ comes to the world and exchanges their junk. All we offer to him is our sin. We don't have anything that looks very valuable at all. We, I mean, he calls us a pearl. He calls us a treasure. Well, it doesn't look like that. That's because he makes us that. He exchanges with us our junk for his righteousness and then declares us to be infinitely valuable, worthy of eternal life forever and ever and ever. So the question I have for you in closing is can you believe that about yourself? That through faith in Jesus Christ, that yes, you really are seen as his treasure? That you really are this pearl of infinite price? That God finds you so lovely that he'd sacrifice everything to have you? Because it's true. It's true. And that is what we build our lives upon. The fact that a treasure hunter has gone to the greatest lengths imaginable to make us his own, to buy us back, 
for that, we give him praise. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the one who seeks after us. We are like the lost sheep. We are prone to wandering, as the famous hymn says it. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Indeed, Father, that is our prayer. And now, Lord, we come to you with the prayer that our Savior gave us with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. just begun Where would I go if it wasn't for your grace Humble yourself upon a cross and took my place I don't know where to go On this road I trod I have seen the car you are my source, my strength, my life, my all. You are the only You are the only one. You are my hope, my peace, my strength when I am weak. You are the only one I will now proclaim glory of me. Love is what you give away. Somehow I'm lost for words. I don't know what to say. So I leave a legacy. So we meet again. You have called me free. Every 
Well, thank you for joining us this morning for worship. I hope that you were encouraged by the music and by the word of the Lord today. I want to remind you, there was a survey sent out about reopening and what that can look like here at Hillside. You should have received that via email if you're on our email list. Really encourage you to fill out that, at least fill out what you can and get that back to uh, the church office uh, so that we can get a sense of Uh, how to move forward and how to take steps towards reopening as soon as possible. I also want to remind you that you can support the ministry of Hillside by going to the website and clicking on the Give tab. Every gift is deeply appreciated, and uh, we are grateful. So no further announcements for this morning. As we prepare to leave, receive the benediction from Numbers chapter 6. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Let's sing together, church. Your perfect law exposes me And I feel my sin and desperate need my best good works are powerless to satisfy your righteousness. But there is one who lived for me. His life, my only victory. His death. day church we love you miss you god bless see you soon